Magabda. War is always deplorable. Well, almost always. Well, almost always both sides are wrong, but you know, occasionally there's a side that's right. But sometimes it cannot be avoided. And if that be the case, far from shunning it at a ruler responsible for the welfare of his people should carry it on resolutely and courageously with the one aim in view of bringing it speedily to a happy conclusion. Such was Kanishka's maxim, and he acted accordingly, having gathered as strong an army as he could muster. He surprised the mountaineers by coming upon them suddenly with superior forces from both sides. They made a des desperate resistance, but he overthrew them and leaving garrisons in some places of strategic importance, carried the war farther into the heart of the kingdom of Magadha, he descended into the valley of the Ganges and hurrying by forced marches through the vassal kingdoms of Delhi and Suravasti, the Gandhara army marched in four columns toward the capital of the country. Sabahu, king of Magadha met his adversary in the field near Pata the Putra with an army that had been rapidly assembled, but he could not stay the invaders' victorious progress. In several engagements, his troops were scattered by the four winds, his elephants captured, and he was obliged to retire to the fortresses of Pata the Putra. There he was besieged. And when he saw that no hope of escape was left, he decided to make no further resistance and sent a messenger to King Kanishka, asking him for terms of peace. The victor demanded an indemnity of 300 million gold pieces, a sum which the whole kingdom could not produce. When the besieged king asked for less severe terms, Kanishka replied, if you are anxious to procure peace, come out to me in person, and I will listen to your proposition. I wish to see you. Let us meet face to face, and we will consider our difficulties. Sipahu, knowing the uselessness of further resistance, came out with his minister, and accompanied by his retinue, he was conducted into the presence of Kanishka, who requested him to be seated. The king of Magadha complied with the request of his victorious rival. With the air of a high-minded man, the guest of his equal, Kanishka frowned upon him. He observed the self-possession of his conquered foe with feeling and re of resentment. However, was somewhat alloyed with admiration. After a pause, he addressed the royal petitioner as follows. Why didst thou not render justice to me when I asked for it? My intentions were good, replied Sabahu. I wanted to preserve peace. The mountaineers are restless, but they are religious and full of faith. Their chieftains assured me the people had only retaliated wrongs, and they had suffered themselves trying to be fair and just to my vassals. I roused the worst evil of war, and in preserving the peace at home, I conjured up a specter of hostility from abroad. He who would avoid trouble sometimes breeds greater misfortune. In other words, interrupted King Kanishka sternly, your weakness prevented you from punishing the evildoers under your jurisdiction and being incapable of governing your kingdom, you lost your power and the right to rule. Sir, replied the humiliated monarch with calm composure, thou art the victor, and thou canst deal with me at thy pleasure. But if the fortunes of the day had turned against thee, thou mightest stand now before me in the same degraded position in which thou now seest me. But the difference is this. I have a clean conscience. I have proved peaceful. I never gave offense to anybody consciously. Thou hast carried the war into my country. Thou art the offender, and shouldst thou condemn me to die, 
I shall die innocent to be reborn in a happier state under more auspicious conditions. The Lord Buddha be praised. Well, that's where I would differ. I don't think Buddha want to be, you know, praise be to Buddha instead of praise be to God or something. Um, I don't see any indication of that, but or that he wanted it to be about his personality at all. Kanishka was astonished at the boldness of the king's speech, but he mastered his anger and replied calmly, Art thou so ignorant as not to know that a ruler's first duty is justice, and to me justice thou hast refused? Man's first duty is to seek salvation, replied the king of Magadha, and salvation is not obtained by harshness, but by piety. The king of Gandhara rose to his feet. Thou art fitted for a monk, not a martyr. Thou hadst better retire to the cloistered cell of a Vihara than occupy the throne of a great empire. What is the use of piety if it does not help thee to attain the duties of thy high office? It leads thee into misery and has cost thee thy throne. The world cannot prosper on the principles which thou followest. Sabahu seemed imperturbable and without deigning to look at the incensed face of his Vitu Praetor, he exclaimed, What is the world if we but gain salvation? Let all the thrones on earth be lost and the whole nations perish if only emancipation can be obtained. We want escape not secular enhancement. Well, secular enhancement can be spiritualized. But Kanishka stared at the speaker as if unable to comprehend his frame of mind. And Sabahu, without showing any concern, quoted a stanza from the Dhammapada saying, the king's mighty chariots of iron will rust and also our bodies resolve into dust but deeds tis sure for a endure. Filled with admiration of Sibahu's fortitude, Kanishka said, I see thou art truly a pious man, but thy piety is not of the right kind. Thy way of escape leads into emptiness, and thy salvation is hollow. This world is the place in which the test of truth must be made, and this life is the time in which it is our duty to attain nirvana. But I will not now upbraid thee for thy errors. I will first raise thee to a dignified position in which thou canst answer me and give thy arguments. I understand that thou art a faithful disciple of the Buddha and meanest to do that which is right. I respect thy sincerity and greet thee as a, as a brother. Therefore, I will not deprive thee of thy crown and title, but I insist on the penalty of 300 million gold pieces. Thou shalt remain king with the understanding that henceforth thou takest counsel with me on all questions of political importance. This is not just a social power play. There's sort of principles involved, right? For I see clearly that thou standest in need of advice, but in place of the 300 million gold pieces, I will accept substitutes, which I deem worth that amount. First, thou shalt deliver into my hands the bowl, which the Tathagata, the Blessed Buddha, carried in his hand when he was walking on earth, and secondly, as a ransom for thy royal person, which I hold here besieged at Palad besieged in Pataliputra, I request from thee, the philosopher Achvagosha, whose fame has spread through all the countries where the religion of enlightenment is preached. Well, Bhutti Yoga kind of was contained in India, Pakistan sort of area initially, yeah. Um, and then it turned into Buddhism. The vanquished king said, truly the bowl of Buddha and the philosopher Achvagosha are amply worth 300 million gold pieces. And yet I must confess that thou art generous and thy conditions of peace are bare. Do not call me generous, said Kanishka, embracing the king of Magadha. 
I am only worldly wise, and it is not my own wisdom. I have learned the maxims of my politics from the Blessed One, the Great Buddha.